In this new business masterclass, Robert talks to Ben Potter. Ben helps agencies to win the right clients. He is a mentor for agency owners and business development managers. Ben shares his insight into the business development world, talking about how to get more clients and why agencies struggle with new clients. Hello and welcome to the Guide to Talks and today I am absolutely delighted to have Ben Potter. Uh, ben Potter, you can almost put in as a middle name, is business development and I have a suspicion that the if there's a headline for what we're going to talk about today, it's going to be you know, how to make business development not easy, but easier. So, hello, Ben. Hello. How are we? Uh, we're, I think we're great. We're really good at this. Good. Thing. Really delighted to have you with us today. So, Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Let's go straight into it. So, can you yeah. briefly, briefly describe Ben Potter for people who don't know the thing that is Ben Potter? The thing that is Ben Potter, that sounds very, uh, very grand. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I help agencies win the right clients. Um, ultimately, that is my uh, that is my job. Um, I emphasize the word right because I think too many uh, agencies and clients aren't well matched for varying different reasons. Uh, but my job is to really go in and work with often the agency owners on putting in place the necessary frameworks, processes and skills so they can make business development easier. Not easy, as you said, uh, but certainly easier by the end of that time together. So are you a consultant? Are you a coach? Are you uh, a general The, 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 the official title is, is mentor. I, I, I purposely avoided the word coach because having read up on it and read one or two books, I think coaching is a very specific skill of which arguably I don't quite yet have. Um, I... I whether there's a difference between coaching and mentoring, I'm not entirely sure, but um, it is a word I avoided. But I tend to be working with agency owners, but often I'll also be working with junior to mid-level BDMs. And that's where it probably is more of a, a mentor type relationship. So um, I guess I guess let's start with the end in mind. So how did you how did you get to 2020? What 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 is your your very potted history? Just so very potted, so very potted history. So we can understand where, mm. where you've come from to be doing that now. Yeah, um, I studied marketing at university. I only tell this story because it is relevant to where I'm at today. I remember in the last year, a lecturer turned around to all of us and said, 75% of you in this room will go into sales. We all went, no bloody way. We'll all be doing creative marketing roles. Lo and behold, a few months later, uh, I'm in a recruitment job doing sales and um, if I look at all of my mates that were at university at that time, they're all in sales roles of some form or another. So it started back there. Um, I was lucky in that I moved down to Brighton about 2003 from Hertfordshire, met a lady called Rosie. Um, she set up an agency when she was four months pregnant. I looked at her and thought that was a good idea um, and the rest, as they say, is history. So during the 13 or 14 years that we ran that agency, Whilst my job title was commercial director, uh, what that really meant was business development. So I learned an awful lot about what works, what doesn't. I made an awful lot of mistakes over that time. Um, and um, at the end of that, um, around about three years ago, we sold off part of the agency to another business in Brighton. And that was the opportune time for me to uh, reconsider where I wanted to go next. And since that time, I have been... Uh, consulting, mentoring, coaching, whatever we're going to call that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that was just over three years ago. And um, here I am, still paying the bills. There's still a roof over the head. So, seems to be going okay. Okay, so let's let's just get on with the... So, so our audience, our prime audience is, is digital agency. Mm. We also get a lot of people who are agent, what I call agency folk, but not as far as estate agents. I mean, okay. <laughs> So it's it's kind of that branding piece, and there's always yeah. I think there's a lot we all have in common. Yeah. I, the six million, the six million dollar question, the thing that drives me totally bonkers. Yes, um, I think you know what it is. <laughs> it, is why do agencies struggle with business development? Mm, mm. I mean, I it's like number it's number one on, on our Facebook group piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 1100 people. You know, yeah. uh, what is it you want to know more about? More sales. What do you want to yes. know about business development? What do you want to know about? Why can't we get more better customers? In fact, yeah. you know, I was just telling you just before we went online, I did this really big 
important workshop and everyone from Ogilvy and they're all there in their Versace stuff and I was I thought <laughs> oh god my PowerPoint deck is useless we won't use the PowerPoint deck we'll go back yeah. and, you know what is it you want to know about so what is it you want to know about by one o'clock let's put it up on the flip chart and these guys and gals with their multi-million multi-billion pound agencies mm. uh, international global intergalactic what did they all want to know? How do we get more better plants? <laughs> so, 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 come on, tell me why? Why do agencies struggle with business development? In my, in my experience, having now obviously worked in agencies and now worked alongside dozens of agencies in the last kind of two or three years, I tend to find it comes down to three or four things fairly consistently across the board. Um, I think uh, it's a cultural thing. It's often about the agency owners and their um, understanding or lack of understanding and appreciation of what actually business development means in today's world. Um, and I don't think it's given, or it's very, very rare that I find it's given the same level of attention as other areas of the agency. So agencies love to make sure the service offering is great and the operations are good and they've got the finances nailed down, et cetera, et cetera. You will know that as well as I. And they put a lot of time and attention into that. I don't think it's, uh, I think it's particularly rare to find the same level of attention given to business development and, and marketing if we want to wrap that, wrap that together. Right. Um, so, so culture and attention. So typical 25-person mm. agency. I mean, I'm working with a, a 28 person full service agency at the moment. Mm -hmm. people. They have just taken on their first business development person. Okay. Okay. So, so 25 people, yeah. around about two and a half million turnover, mm. gorgeous, lovely work, fantastic. Mm. And when you say to them, so, so what's, what's the strategy for getting customers? And they actually said to me, well, actually, Robert, it's really interesting. Just when it goes really quiet, then the phone rings. Right. <laughs> guys, guys, that is not a strategy. That is just, just hope is not a method. Okay. Absolutely. So yes. culture and, and attention and focus. So that's, that's absolutely. And I think I think what that what that tends to result in is that often agency owners will jump from fix to fix to fix um the classic kind of silver bullet well we'll go and try a bit of that oh that didn't work now let's go and try a bit of that or oh, that didn't work and that can also extend actually to bringing in a bdm i think often they are seen as the solution uh there you go stick them in the corner there's the telephone book there's the pc um and the sales will start flying in and i think the reality is it doesn't work that way for me it's very much a team effort so there is that kind of cultural thing of we are all in this we can all play a part but i think it's quite rare to rare to find that so there's definitely something in that i think positioning i think we are gonna no doubt talk about this in more depth later on um, depending on what you read there are 20,000 30,000 maybe 35,000 agencies of various sizes and guises in the uk um, and if you look at them, as you will see, they pretty much all look and sound the same. Uh, from a buyer's point of view, where do you where do you possibly start? So I think we we operate in what is fast becoming, if not is already, a highly commoditized market. Um, so I think there's a piece around positioning. How do you define an audience? How do you stand out? How do you attract the right kind of work? As well as if you're going out to find it, be more focused and targeted in how you do that. Um, and in that, I think there is a lack of proactivity with respect to actually going out and making stuff happen. Um, of course, all these things are tied together, aren't they? If you don't know who your ideal client is, how do you know where to, where to start in reaching them? Um, so they're all they're all interconnected. I think the final thing is how do we actually manage a lead when we get them through the door? I think we are at the mercy of uh, client processes. You know, they say jump, or they say they say jump. We say how high. Um, it's a failure to try and influence or control that process. And I think a lot of agencies find themselves wasting huge amounts of time um, to ultimately become what one of my clients described as pitch candy. Um, and that is uh, spending all that time on something you're ultimately never going to win because they end up staying with the incumbent or not doing anything new or different. So I think there's a failure around that process piece as well. 
I mean, anyone who, who, who's spoken to me recently, we've just, uh, we just put out a piece of work for a very specific type of site for a client. And we put it out mm. to the agencies. And it was an agency that had a speciality that had done 20 sites like this site. I'm not going to be any more specific yeah. than that. And it was unbelievable to be on the other end of, of their process. process. <laughs> so, so and it was it was mind numbing. They they wanted twenty thousand quid, which is fine. Mm. Um, so, but in the proposal, it said stage one exploration and discovery, six thousand mm. pounds. Stage two, uh, first draft. Stage three, final draft. And uh, when we went back to them and said, "Sorry, we don't quite understand what we're getting for our money. Could you just sort of outline mm. deliverables were?" We just want mm. to start saying we don't think you're the right client for us. If you're asking us and questioning us now, then we don't wish to work with you. Right. Okay. <laughs> we, 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 we all what we want what we agreed was we're not going to do it for twenty, but if they'll do it for eighteen, they can have our business. Yes. We yeah. Our track record, and it was, right. it was it was absolutely bizarre. So 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 I'm absolutely with you about about agencies getting their their end process right mm, so mm. Talk about as well i know we're kind of jumping around but it all no, that's that's good all coming to get it comes together mm. in a way um th th it feels to me there's three different things going on there's there's the referrals piece around mm. we could do we do good work people tell other people about us uh then the next level up is what i what i call farming which is where mm. we physically go out and we actually do stuff actively yeah. encourage relationships whether that's referral scripts or whether that's um uh having really clear elevator pitch and so on and so forth mm. and then there's a mm. top bit which is what i which i i call hunting which yeah. is, you know where you literally draw up a list of 200 clients you'd like to work with and sit down yeah. and what they want and you and you go after them yeah. At our conference last month, last well, more than last month, um, uh, Gareth, uh, who worked with me, who used to run an agency with 180 people, mm. said, it kind of hit me like this. He said, the one thing I wish I'd done was I'd started, that I'd started hunting earlier on. It didn't dawn mm. on me, grow the agency I need to be hunting. Mm. I'd be really interested to know your view on hunting because... There's a lot of people who say, oh, if you hunt, then you get the wrong sort of people. If you hunt, it's the wrong mentality. Farmers can't hunt. Mm. Uh, we can grow. And then there's the, we can grow our business organically. So I, I yeah. think that's just about, so if there's three levels, I mean, mm. you've got a, a more sophisticated view of the world than me, which is mm. referrals, farming, and hunting. How, yeah. do, how do those things fit together in, in, your, in your world? I'm I'm absolutely with you, and I'm with and I'm with Gareth. Um, I think um, in in my experience, far too many agencies are simply reliant on what happens to come through the front door, whether that's through referrals, um, or whether that is through a little bit of a little bit of farming, um, if if we call it that. Um, but they don't tend to make things happen. They don't define very specifically who they want to work with. And they don't take a proactive approach to say, okay, well, how can we get in front of these people? How can we influence their thinking? And ideally, how can we do that before they start writing a brief and go to market? I think one of the, the myths of, I'm going to call it inbound. I don't like the word inbound because it's a word made up by HubSpot to sell software. But this oh, idea fly. of... <laughs> yes, yeah. This, this idea that if we create lots of content and we put it out there, uh, we market it, however we do that, whether we do it for free or whether we pay. Um, the assumption that the people that we want to see that will see it. I think that's misguided. I think, yes, inbound or just digital marketing, let's call it that, um, every agency should be doing it. But there is no guarantee that just by putting that content out there, the people that you want to see it are going to do so. And that's where I believe any sales and marketing plan will have a blend of referrals but done proactively i'm sure we'll come back to that later on we'll have a blend of the inbound or the outbound or the farming um, or the hunting and it needs to it needs to be a little bit of all of those things rather than well we only adopt an inbound strategy or we only adopt outbound for me it will be a blend 
it will be a blend. And I don't see nearly enough agencies identify what that right client looks like and do the things they need to do to get in front of them early and influence their thinking. And that's what we're trying to do through hunting, isn't it, really? We don't want them to go to market and write a brief. We want to try and influence that thinking earlier on. But the bizarre thing is, this is what they blinking well do for clients. They, they get a yes. client, they say to yeah. clients, so who is your customer avatar? What is their problem? What is their herd? Yeah. Yes. What is it? How can we approach them? And whether they're a, a, a performance agency mm. or a branding agency, you know, heaven forbid that they haven't figured that out for their own clients. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is real holes of, oh, sorry, shoes of, of cobblers having holes. Yeah. Yes, and, yeah. And, you know, so you start, you, you start built. I think what's interesting is, uh, although I'm on the borders of a couple of agencies, I kind of feel that I'm slightly outside and that's, the, and that's, and that's the power that we have. Mm, mm. Think agents are coming in. But if an agency is all about doing good work, you know, mm. how, how often is, is the tagline good work, good people, you know, mm. Mm. Um, if, if their preoccupation is with good work, if, if they only have, on average, one business development manager per 25 staff, if mm. the business development is left to the poor, exhausted director of owner, founder, mm. who's also doing a bit of FD work, who's also doing, also doing that, you know, if they don't do some hunting themselves, they don't have a clear sense of of their value if they haven't got a clear proposition then mm, mm. sorry blood pressure you're, you're <laughs> pressure. okay so and, th and, th and therein lies the issue and that's why a few moments ago we said all of these things are interconnected if you don't have a very clear idea of who your ideal client is and you haven't nailed down that positioning piece of which the who is a key part of me who is it that we are best placed to serve I think it makes it very difficult to go out and hunt because, I mean, you try, you try write, writing a sales and marketing plan when, in essence, you're trying to target everyone. It's, it's nigh and impossible. Now have another go when you are targeting uh, retailers of under a million quid, for example, that are looking to elevate their business to five million quid. You know, that's a very clear segment of the market that an agency might be able to own. All of a sudden, that brings clarity to say, OK, well, now we can we can go out and we can hunt because we know where these people are. We know where they hang out. We know the events they go to. We know their problems. We can write content. All of this stuff starts to slot in place. But that's much more difficult when effectively we can do anything for everyone. Um, and I think therein lies the issue. You've got to get the positioning piece nailed first and then your ability to hunt becomes infinitely easier yeah, yeah i mean i wrote i wrote um about three four five years ago whatever it was i wrote two books in the same year one was grow your digital agency aimed yeah. at agency i've read it yeah <laughs> you, you put a, a um some comments down in amazon yeah, uh, we'll i wrote a book at the same time with a guy called adam harris called check-in strategy journal and okay, checking strategy journals bigger and heavier and weightier. But basically, the premise of both is the same, which is where are you now? Where are you going? Mm. How can we get there? What are the steps on the way? Mm. Fascinating thing is that checking strategy journal was competing against anything and everything in the world of personal development and training. We were competing against Venice, we were competing against Stephen Covey, we were competing against. Anthony Robbins, mm -hmm. and, and, and it was almost impossible to get any traction at all. I mean, yeah. virtually no traction at all. Whereas Grow Your Digital Agency, if the numbers of sales are to be believed, just about every digital agency in this country has a copy of it. Right, so, okay. So my, my point is, is, is simply that by niching, mm. uh, you can become a very large player in a very small fish pond and, and the quote yeah. one, the agent the agency i always love to talk about is conscious solutions in bristol you know if you work okay. work with lawyers with between 25 and 150 desks mm. one person yeah. Appears yeah and it's and they know more about lawyers than lawyers do mm. uh, 
and they've got a system and a process, and it's, and it's a lovely business, it's run by lovely people, mm. uh, and it's the power of niching. You know, they don't yeah. work with accountants, they don't work, work with, they don't work with, you know, architects, they don't work with, although they could, but what they yeah. do, they, they're famous for one thing. Yeah. Um, What's your view on the on the? Uh, I'm, I'm switching things around here a little bit and asking you the question. But what's the? Uh, <laughs> what's your What's your view on the, the the potential limitations that niching down too far? Because that that for me is often the greatest concern for an agency owner. And when I talk about niching and and and, and defining an audience, I think the assumption is always well that being sectors. Well, actually, I think you can you can define an audience in a number of different ways, which might mean you don't limit yourself too much. Absolutely. But that's often that's often the concern. Well, if we niche down too far, we won't be able to grow. There's only so far we will be able to take that. What, what's your what's your view on that? Well, firstly, it doesn't have to be by sectors. It could be by site or graphics, yeah. so it could be ambient, yeah. or it could be challenger, or it could mm. be uh, not for profit. So I think you, I think you don't. Yeah. Need... The second thing is if you if you there's a, a a book called Thought Leaders Practice by Matt Church and Peter Cook, not the Peter Cook and Dutton nor Peter, Cook. <laughs> and they run a thing called the Thought Leaders Business School, and they've got this model. I'll be really quick because it's mm. that they say you take your IP, you, you itemize your IP, so your IP could be twenty five different things you can sell. You mm. then decide what. Uh, platform you're going to use to sell it. So that could be a uh, membership site, it could be keynote speaking, it could be books, it could be discussion forum, it could mm. be DPC. And then you decide what your target customer is. So it could be uh, management directors or finance directors, finance industry, service industry, blah, 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 you break it down. And they mm. basically say that you select you know, one piece of IP that you sell on one platform to one target customer. And if you take that approach, that kind of approach, once, I mean, I, yeah, once Conscious Solutions has exhausted the 230 towns in the UK each having a lawyer, yeah. then they can go back and they can do exactly the same thing for accountants or architects. Mm. Mm. The IP, the DNA of the IP exists, yeah. just coated and presented in a different way, in the same way yeah. that. I've been asked to go from digital agencies to agencies, and from agencies I've now been asked to work with IFA, sort of, mm. and you kind of make a decision about, uh, are you a, not a one-trick pony, but are you, are you yeah. deep? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and narrow, or are you wide and broad? And I think yes. it's, it's easier to identify the competition, it's easier to identify the, the, the potential customers, it's easier to identify their needs, wants and hurts, and Mm -hmm. Mighty. So yeah, I think, yeah. I think uh, how important is positioning? I think we're kind of saying positioning is everything. I think so. Yeah, I I always ask people to imagine a, um, a pyramid, a bit like the Maslow pyramid, but a business development version. Positioning for me is the foundation. If you get that right. Everything else that sits on top of that in terms of writing your proposition, in terms of building your sales and marketing plan, having a framework for how you qualify prospects, pitching, presenting, all of that becomes, again, not easy, but becomes easier by getting the position and piece nailed down at the beginning. I think inevitably when you are a generalist, um, and uh, you know, I, generally I describe that as an agency that are doing lots of things for lots of different people, um, inevitably that's where you're going to fall into the trap of potentially being commoditized, downward pressure on pricing, a lot more competitive pitching, probably a lot more tendering, a lot more of the pitch candy that I referred to earlier on. So for me, positioning, absolutely key. And is there a, a model or a a toolkit that you that you use around positioning is it just the marketing 101 you get out of Kotler or whatever people are um, for, for, for me it comes in, in terms of how I define what good positioning is in an agency context I think it's I think it's three things it's defining that audience um, and as we said I think there are a multitude of ways you can do that and you can get quite creative with how you define the audience a few examples we referred to earlier it's not only sector um, it might be where a client is on their journey, what they're trying to achieve, aspirations. It might be targeting a certain demographic. There are different ways of being able to do that, um, as well as some of the ones you referred to a moment ago. The second thing is I do think um, the agencies that tend to 
stand out, stand for something. Now, I'm not going to start going into Simon Sinek. Um, I do think, eh, I do think um, I'm, I'm very much in the middle with this. When I first read it, I went full hammer and tongs and I disappointed myself when I couldn't find an agency um, that had that real proper sense of purpose. Because I think a lot of the reasons why agencies have been created, whilst there is a sense of purpose there, it's not necessarily relevant to the end client. They don't care that you worked for a big agency, thought it was a bit crap and thought you set up on your own. That's great. That's your purpose. But it's irrelevant to the client. Um, but I do think if it's not a sense of purpose that you want to put front and center or should be front and center, it's standing for something. It's having a point of view. It's, it's not just drifting into the mirror of creating how to update your meta tags or how to do PPC better. It's actually having a bit of a point of your perspective that should be a little bit like Marmite in the sense that it's going to attract some people who share that point of view. It's actually going to attract others that don't. And I think that's, that that's the part of it. Who they are, who we are. Who they are, yeah. Who we are. Third, uh, sorry? So it's who they are, who yeah. we are. Who we are, yeah. And I think the final thing in terms of actually how you bring all this to life is just avoiding all the agency, uh, the agency speak, the the blurb, the um, uh, the the jargon, the, the the passionate, the award winning, the integrated, even the full service. I think a lot of the language that agencies use. A, when you actually step back from it, and I'm in the fortunate position where you and I can do that, and we can kind of get away with being a bit more forthright in our opinion, um, I read a lot of it and go, actually, this is meaningless. It, it's not relevant to what the client is looking to actually buy. Um, and because everybody else is saying it, it actually loses its meaning even more so. So I try and encourage my clients anyway to be more down to earth, more human, use normal even colloquial day-to-day -day language rather than the language of agency. I'd even go a step further. I think some of the some of the language of business has become a bit tired. Sales, revenue, market share, for me, they're almost a given. Can you find a more creative way of expressing that, which is possibly a bit more emotive? So that's my kind of criteria for good positioning. And then, yes, there is a whole process that I would work through with a client that involves uh, workshopping with the with the senior team it involves speaking to clients speaking to staff um, to try and find that that thing it's always there um, it's whether they're willing to make the sacrifices needed to to specialize and to bring that thing to life but you but you kind of got to this bit about about the words that could be used and how the words could be used and that they shouldn't be the standard award winning mm. number one Google Premier yeah. Um, yeah, and and then I was kind of waiting for you to say, for example, the sort of phrase <laughs> that might, might appeal, might be, and you kind of went off. So, ah. what kind of, I mean, without being totally specific about what you've done, I mean, what what hmm. an example of what of what <clears throat> what How you might bring that to life. Yeah, I think thing? you know, don't don't get me wrong. All these things are there. You know, they are they are features um, yeah. of which an agency will want to talk about at some point, and I totally get that. Um, it's just when you read a proposition which is literally plastered with integrated, award-winning, passionate, honest, friendly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. To give an example, I did, um, and I, 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 I won't name them because. Um, we're going to Google it now. <laughs> <laughs> but I worked, I worked with an agency and I'm still working with them now down in London. And we went through this whole process and realised that most, if not all, of their clients are, are challengers. We, 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 we talked about that earlier, challenger brands. They operate at number two, three, four or five in the market. There is an acceptance that they're never going to be number one because the number one player is too far ahead. Um, but they want to make life difficult for that number one player in the market. And through a client interview, one of, the, uh, one of the people I was interviewing said, what we're looking to doing is really close the gap on that number one player. And I thought, close the gap. What a wonderful way of articulating in a more emotive way what they are trying to do. We could have just said they're trying to eat into market share or take revenue away from the leading player. So we ended up using that phrase. And that wouldn't have come out unless we'd actually spoken to the client and got their perspective on it. So a small example of where I think you can avoid some of the language of business and actually express the same thing in hopefully a more emotive, interesting way. Nice. Very nice.
Very nice indeed. I can't take the credit for it, of course, because it was the, the client's client, but it, it wouldn't have happened without, I think, that conversation taking place. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, so who, in, who in the agency should be managing new business, new business development? You're going to hate me because I'm going to say it depends. Um, I think it depends on uh, the size of agency. I was interesting earlier when you said that they've taken on their first BD around about 25, 28 people. Um, I think they've done pretty well to get to that stage without having, out of interest, have they ever brought somebody in before and it failed? Or was that literally the first time they brought that BD in? No, they are a really lovely, lovely bunch of people. Mm. Really lovely work. Yeah. Uh, and and they have an incredible um, commitment and loyalty from their clients. So they've always managed to maintain the agency by doing really really great work. I mean, all the kind of in a way the user going the extra mile, doing great work, really understanding, yeah. and and making it a pleasure to work with. Yes. And, yeah. And then suddenly they realise that, uh, as often happens with with agencies, actually. Uh, we've got five more years or seven more years at this game. So if yeah. we do something serious about it, let's be a bit more business-like. So yeah. let's step up to the plate. And rather than yeah. hope is not a method, let's actually invest in the future and and and, and ramp and to become more professionalised. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, in answer, in answer to the question, I think uh, of an agency uh, of a certain size, uh, inevitably, it's going to fall on the agency owners, um, those that are uh, most senior. And I think that works to an extent, particularly at the beginning. There's a, a huge amount of excitement and enthusiasm. They're going to probably have a network of people that they can lean on for the, the referrals that they need to get the agency to, I think, a certain a certain point. Um, and I often find that agency owners are good at the bit where they're in front of people. Um, they can get very excited. They can ask the questions and so on. They're probably not quite so good at the what I describe in the nicest possible way as grunt work. And that is a lot of the, the research. It's a lot of the, the outbound activity, prospecting, if you want to call it that. It's, it's, it's all of that stuff that needs to happen to generate those opportunities. It's the, it's the hunting bit that possibly they're not quite so good at, depending on their background. Um, Ultimately, the best person in the in the agency would be a dedicated business developer, but they're few and far between in my experience. Finding good business developers is tough. That can blend the sales skills with the industry know-how or the product knowledge of that particular agency. There are just not that many of them uh, around. Um, that would be the ideal in an agency of maybe 15, 20, 25 people. Um, otherwise, it might be a sales and marketing exec that's doing a lot of the the grunt work, I say it again, um, and they are almost kind of trying to tee things up, if you like, for the agency owners to then go out there and, and kind of do their thing. Um, taking a step back from all of that, I would say it's a team effort. Uh, it's not down to one single person in that agency. It can't be. The skills, the attributes needed to drive leads and win business are so far, way, uh, so far reaching mm. that it can't ever come down to a single person in my view anyway everybody in my view can bring something to the party whether that's managing social creating content going to an event everybody will have something that they can use in order to help that agency um, attract business um, but it's often not seen as that kind of cultural thing that i think it needs to be so so what does work best in terms of lead gen lead generation um I think if you're going to ask most agencies what is the best source of leads, they will always say referrals. Um, but um, very rare, again, are referrals sought in a more proactive manner. It tends to be, well, we'll just wait for those referrals to come into us rather than saying, who is it again that we actually want to speak to? How are we connected to those people? How can we use our existing network to tap into those uh, those organizations and those people. So I think there is a more proactive way of doing it. Um, again, if you were to ask me what's best, is it is it inbound, is it outbound, is it maybe more traditional marketing and PR, like speaking at events or going to events? Again, I don't think one is any better than the other. I think for any agency, it's probably going to be a blend of four, five, six things done 
very, very well, rather than 20 things done averagely or, or, or poorly. Um, yeah. But you can't, it, it is a flywheel, you know, unless you've got the positioning and who you're targeting and what their problem, mm. what their issue is and what they're looking for and what your competition are mm. offering. You're not able to present to them in a way that they lean in, never mind get them to the event, never mind yeah. have a conversation with them, and never mind have a, have a half decent selling and closing process. Yes, yeah. So, Absolutely. Okay. It goes, it goes back to that same point again that, you know, if you're going to create that sales and marketing plan, if you're going to define those activities, you firstly, and this is marketing 101, you first need to define the audience. Who are we actually trying to speak to? What do they read? Where do they hang out? What events do they go to? What are their problems? Let's create some content around that. You know, unless you've done that piece first, inevitably defining what those five, six, seven activities are going to be and whether it's maybe weighted a bit more towards inbound or whether you do need to do more of the hunting is very difficult to do if you don't firstly define the audience in the first, uh, the first place. Okay, I'm going to just uh, go through a few quick fire questions which we're asking. Cool. <laughs> uh, just so we get a bit of an insight into who Ben is, really. And, and, then, okay. we'll, and then we'll come back more to back to the business and what your recommendations are. So, yeah. ben, what's your favorite movie? Uh, favorite movie? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very good at favorites because I just think there's so much good stuff out there. If, you, I had to, if I had to narrow it down to one, a film that if I happen to be channel hopping and it's on, I would always stop and watch it. It would be Pulp Fiction. I think maybe it's an era <laughs> thing. You know, when it came out, we watched it on repeat. And then every time I see it, it's the only film that I'll go, yeah, I'll sit back and watch this again. And you can, you can jump into it anywhere. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, so at any point, if it's the last 10 minutes or the first 15 minutes, oh, yeah. And then before you know it, it's one o'clock in the morning on a Friday and the kids are going to be up at six. But um, it's the one film that I will always watch. Regardless. Favourite album? Favourite album? Oh, again, my, my musical tastes are very wide and varied. I used, to, I used to DJ back in the day, occasionally still do. So very into kind of dance music and stuff like that. But anything from rock to rap uh, uh to, to, to to folk and everything in between but i was i was raised in the in the states for about four or five years when i was very small and that meant that my mum fed me on a diet of bruce springsteen so i am a, a very big uh boss fan if i was going to narrow it down to one album i think it would be darkness on the edge of town right back to his early stuff uh yes it's uh, it'd probably be the boss and what's the uh, go-to phrase that you probably use too much uh, it's probably something like, at the end of the day, business development is very simple. It comes down to doing enough of the right things consistently well, always. I'm finding myself saying that all of the time. Uh, but it's true. It's true. Consistency is, is key. Um, so, yeah, uh, I probably bought myself for the number of times I say that. Okay. So, so uh, what, I mean, the question for me at the moment really is what will, what will agencies look like in in three years time bearing in mind the shifts in consumers customers mm. advertisers branding um and everything else that's going on in the world politics <laughs> goodness knows yeah where will the world be in three years time um i i i actually don't think um overall it's going to look significantly different to where we are today. I think you're right. I think there are certain things, uh, technologies and so on, such as AI, AR, voice, that I think are possibly overhyped a little bit at the moment. Um, if you were to speak to the vast majority of SMEs in the UK, you know, AI, AR, voice isn't on their radar. I think that will become more prevalent. And I do think that means a, an agency's service offering uh, will need to evolve. Um, but I think if we were sat here having this conversation in three years' time, I think there will be just as many agencies. Some of the agencies we know today won't be here, but in their place will be uh, a number of other agencies filling, filling that void. Um, I think there will be more of a trend towards specialisation. And I think, you know, you could ask 10 clients, what do they prefer? Do they prefer working with five specialists or do they prefer working with one agency? And the answer will be different every time. Um, but I do think there is a move towards agencies being more focused and more specialized. 
Um, I think that the, the, the big issue is going to be around skills. Is going to be around, are there enough good people um, to do the job within, within an agency? Uh, I think that's uh, probably an overarching uh, economical uh, economic issue. But I also think if you look at how people want to work these days, more and more people, we're good examples of that, have worked in organisations and then have gone out and set up on their own and enjoy the, the freedom and lifestyle that, um, that, that working for yourself can bring. And I think we're only going to see more of that, which in turn, which I think will have an impact on agencies and how they can bring in and, and hold on to the right people. I think that's a key, a key challenge. Um, and I think that's the one thing in three years' time we might be sitting here going, hmm, it's even more of a challenge now than it was then. And is that, is that about the, uh, the snowflakes and this, this younger generation <laughs> who have been you know, named for being notoriously entitled, etc., etc., or is that mm. generally right the way through? Do you think? I think I think there's an element, a element of that. I think I think, um, and I I don't like the old millennials and Gen Zs and all that kind of terminology. But I think I think they get a bit of a hard press with respect to 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 that. I just think they have grown up in a very different time and age. I mean, I was joking at a talk I did the other night with a with a slightly younger audience about um, remembering the time when there wasn't the internet and you know people look at you like you're you're nuts. Um, I think I think people that are 20, 25 years old have just grown up in a very different time with a great deal more convenience uh, offered to them than we certainly had when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old. I think their expectations of work and the role it plays in their life is, is, is obviously very different to this kind of play hard, work hard type mentality of the of the 80s and 90s. So I don't necessarily blame them for that. But I think employers need to be able to adjust their approach to work and employment um, to account for it. Um, and and what's what's the the one thing the one thing right now? Uh, sorry, what's the, the biggest challenge you think agencies are facing right now? Because they could argue it's the same thing. Or is it, or yeah, I think I think so. Well, if you if you if I mean going on what we've spoken about today, if you look at. Um, uh, the Wow Company's bench press report, uh, which which I think they're going to be releasing in the next two or three weeks. Last year, it was business development. That was the number one challenge for most agency owners. So I think uh, that means that hopefully I still have a job in three years' time. Um, but I think I think I think I think it is a lot around skill shortage and 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 people to do the jobs. I mean, the number of agencies I speak to who are trying to recruit for PPC people and are unable to find them. Um, is staggering. If I was 20, I'll tell you what I'd be doing. I'd be studying PPC day in, day out, um, because you can go and demand a fairly hefty wage if you do. But I think it, I think it is those two things. It's, it's winning the right work and then it's servicing it, which is ultimately what a, an agency is there to do. I think I know your answer to this one, but I'd be interested to hear it. <laughs> What's the, uh, the one thing that frustrates you most about the agencies that you meet? Excluding your clients, of course. Exclu excluding my clients. Well, I, I, it, again, again, it goes back to that. Um, we're not really growing or the market is tough, but we only rely on referrals for our new business. Um, it's like, well, I'm not surprised it's tough. If you're only reliant on something of which you have very little control over, how do you expect to grow your agency? And inevitably, that's why agencies are up and down like that, because they're not taking control of that. So I think that's that's probably the most frustrating thing I would hear is is they're not joining those dots together. I think there's an expectation that the business will just land, and you and I know it doesn't happen that way. And and, and a, a one line recommendation? Is there a one line recommendation you give to virtually every single agency owner? Some something along the lines of you, you've got to make things happen, make stuff happen, get off, get up. And this is in reference to business development. I think. It goes back to the point earlier. All agencies, I think, are good at defining their service offering and putting all the process around that and making stuff happen with that respect. That they don't make stuff happen enough when it comes to, we want to work with these brands. This fits the profile. We can really add value there. We've done it before. Let's go out and make things happen and get our name in front of them. So I think for most agencies, it's being proactive. I hate to use that word, but it's, it's making stuff happen, getting off your ass and doing it rather than just hoping it's going to land. And um, that happens, what, maybe once a year? Once a year, in my experience, maybe that one dream client came through the front door and you won it and it was, 
it was happy days. But beyond that, we had to go out and, and hunt. We really did. We didn't have the massive budgets and resource and flood of inbound leads that maybe larger agencies have. If you're smaller, you've got to get off your ass and make it happen. So if what you were saying at the, at the, at the top of the program is right, that people don't do biz dev because of the culture, because of the lack of focus, because of the lack of attention, because uh, it's not what they're trying to do, because uh, they don't have the skills in place, because they don't have the positioning in place. Yeah. It's not, if, is, it, is it just as simple as, as sitting people down and saying, let's sort out your positioning statements because out of that we can start figuring out how we're going to reach people. Blah, blah, blah. Or is there, is there some kind of a secret sauce there that <laughs> still needs to be kind of poured in to make it happen? Because, because my point is, all agency owners all read the same stuff. Blah, blah, blah. They all know biz dev's a problem. They all go to the workshop. They all, get, they all read the reports about biz dev being important. Mm, mm. Still, they struggle to find more of the right size, right type of clients because they mm. still don't give biz dev the credit, respect, whatever mm. it is. So yeah, yeah. Is there, is there a secret? I mean, is it, is it just that some people just don't get it and they'll never get it? Or is is it... I mean, is it that you go into people when the, the light bulb kind of goes and people, what, I just don't quite understand. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose often, often, often the trigger for maybe bringing somebody like myself in is they have jumped from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing and found out along the way the hard way that none of those things in isolation have necessarily worked. So, you know, fielding stuff out to a lead gen agency, they do that for a year. That doesn't really work because in my experience, it, it rarely does. Uh, they bring in a BD, but they don't necessarily know how to properly manage and nurture that person. So in three months when they haven't brought business in, they're out the door. So I think, I think often the trigger is, look, we tried everything. There's an acceptance now that if we're going to do this well, we have to really take ownership of it and do it ourselves. We can't just keep sort of farming out to these different, uh, different uh suppliers people whatever else it may be is there is there a secret source it, i honestly don't think there is i think you know ultimately we are dealing with people so i think if you're talking about positioning you've got to have internal alignment everybody's got to be on the same page with respect to what that agency is trying to do i think once that's nailed down which is obviously a part of that positioning piece for me it's it's execution it's it's doing those right things consistently well all the time and what often happens you will know as well as i um the agency win a big bit of business it's all heads down focused on getting that uh, that project done along the way they might lose a client or two and then that project comes to an end and they all lift their heads up look at pipeline and go shit there's nothing there's nothing there um so they turn the tap back on again but of course it takes weeks and months to build that pipeline back up so the secret sauce for me is is very simple to say, very, very difficult to actually get right in most agencies. And it's it's keeping the tap running all of the time. Even when you don't think you need to, keep the tap running. Because you don't know what's around the corner. That lovely client might all of a sudden hand the notice in, no fault of your own, but then, you know, there's a big hole to fill. Um, you can't just turn the tap on then and then expect that you're going to be able to fill that, fill that hole overnight. It just doesn't, doesn't happen like that. Mm, so, so what, what, uh, what next with Ben Potter? Yeah. What next? Um, a couple of years ago, we moved, we moved to the Midlands from Brighton. So I've been spending a lot of time getting to know uh, the world uh, in and around where I am now. So looking at places like Leicester, Nottingham, it's given me a real impetus in terms of places that would be previously inaccessible, I think, from Brighton, really, to start finding out what's going on in this part of the world, even in places like Manchester and Leeds. And I studied Liverpool, so I'll be making my way uh, back, uh, back there in the coming weeks and months. So that's exciting. There's, there's loads going on. It's not all about London. Um, you will know, being down in Bristol, there's always scraps below the surface, and there are hundreds of agencies all doing brilliant stuff. So that's exciting. I've just started doing video. I've, I've finally... Uh, relented to the to the pressure on LinkedIn and started uh, starting doing video uh, about to start a non-exec role for the first time which is exciting so um, that's something I haven't done before um, so yeah more more of the same I think more of the same um, it's an exciting exciting time
Brilliant. And uh, I'd finally um, mm. wrap up, which is a real shame. Yeah. Um, but uh, some, some top tips, or, or what would you do for, you know, pertinent for you if you were, if you were starting or growing a digital agency now? What, what, mm. what, are, your, what are your kind of your, your, your top tips? Uh, firstly, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would, <laughs> unless <laughs> uh, I think I think I think if you're going to start an agency and you are trying to be all things to all people, I think except it's going to be bloody hard work first and foremost. Um, uh, I think if I was going to start an agency, it would be about trying to find that niche or that specialization. Um, um, and then I think I think I think beyond that. Um, it's going to sound quite boring, but it's going to go back to a lot of the themes that we've discussed today about how do you make this stuff easier? And I think it comes down to getting that positioning piece nailed down. It comes down to maybe doing four or five things really, really well when it comes to your sales and marketing activity rather than stretching yourself. I mean, there is so much choice these days. It's like a, a kid in a sweet shop when it comes to all the things you could be doing to attract leads. But my view is in most small agencies, you can probably do four, five, six things really well. So really focus. And then, and then it comes back to that same point again, um, relentless uh, execution and consistency in, in doing those things on an ongoing basis. That is as close as you're going to get to me revealing a, a secret source or a magic <laughs> formula or a, a rabbit out of hat. That's that's it. That really is it. I'd love to. I'd love. I'd love your listeners to to go away with this um, this, um, this this grand reveal of something that they had not considered or done before. But in my experience, it kind of just doesn't. It doesn't exist. It's all of the things we've been talking about uh, today. That has been an absolutely great interview uh thank really, you pleasure really having you on the program ben um and it's just leave me to say a an enormous big thank you people will be able to find your contact details and so on after. yes yeah thank you very much indeed for a, a great conversation thank you not at all thanks for having me